behind me is uh, the bridge uh, in uh, my book Hardcore Zen and also There Is No God and He Is Always With You. I wrote about an experience that I had while walking across this bridge. And some people called it a Kensho experience or like Satori experience or some kind of enlightenment experience. I, I tried not to use those words in the book, although I can't remember if I used those words. But this is the bridge. Um, I guess, if I try to remember right, I was about halfway across the bridge and then this thing suddenly happened. I, I probably went to a Zen retreat maybe the weekend before or something. I don't remember if that's the case, but at that moment it sort of all came together. Like all the, all the stuff that I'd been studying in Zen for about 15 or 20 years by that time. I'd been practicing for about 15 or 20 years by then, probably more like 20. And in a moment it just kind of came together and I realized, oh, everything that my teacher said was actually true. <laughs> You know, the, the universe and the self are the same thing and all of that crazy stuff that they always say in Zen uh, was, at that moment, really obviously true. But, you know, I, I was thinking about this before I came here to shoot the video because we'd been uh, to Kyoto a couple of days ago and there's these pilgrimage places there and they, they, they exist all over Japan where people go to see where something special happened related to, to Zen and I started thinking you know I don't really I'm not so egotistical to believe this would happen but you know what would happen if people started coming to this bridge to, start, to try to find out where the thing you know now that I put books out and the books will probably uh, outlive me you know maybe 50 years from now it could happen that some people come to this bridge to try to see where the thing happened and all they're gonna see is a bridge you know, it's, it's nothing. Um, there was a there was a movie that I watched when I was a kid called The Cube, and it was made by Jim Henson. And it was about it wasn't this. There was a movie in the 90s called The Cube that was a horror movie. It wasn't that one. Anyway, in this movie, a guy lived in a cube. It was kind of existential story, and people could come in and out of the cube, but but uh, he couldn't go through their door. So they'd come in and leave through a door and he'd try to follow them and, he, and they'd go, no, 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 that's my door. It's kind of like that. You, everybody may, might have their own door, I suppose, into an experience like that. And if you try to go to somebody else's door, it's not gonna be the same. But, you know, since I'd written so much about this bridge and what happened on the bridge, I thought I'd come back here, use this opportunity while I'm in Tokyo to come and get a little bit of film of it. It was Yagi-san, my friend who's a uh, director for, I uh, directed a lot of Ultraman shows and movies and things. He's filming me right now. Uh, he was the one who mentioned that it was blue. And I was like, oh, I didn't remember <laughs> that it was blue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I've forgotten that part of it. And, you know, it seemed like it's, the, whatever the experience was, started when I was about in the middle of the bridge and was finished by about the time I got to the other end of the bridge. So, in terms of time by the clock, by the watch, it was really short, but it was also, in, in my uh, internal experience, it was literally forever. I, I don't know if that makes any sense, but it was like eternal time opened up for a moment. Uh, and there, it was right on that bridge. So there you go, now, now you know what the bridge looked like, and now I know what the bridge looked like, because I've forgotten what it looked like. So there you go. All right, hello there, thrill seekers. That was the video that I shot on the bridge that I wrote about in my books, Hardcore Zen and Sit Down and Shut Up. And I don't know how, I don't assume that everybody who watches my videos has actually read my books, but probably most of you have. So I'll do the short version for those of you who might not have read the books. Uh, in those books, I talked about an incident of what some people call a, a, a Kensho experience, a sort of so-called enlightenment experience that I had while walking across a bridge on the way to work, which is what I just explained on the video you just saw. And read the books to hear if you want to know the details. 
The tradition within Zen is that one does not talk or write about these experiences. And it's a long-standing tradition that goes all the way back. Uh, even the Buddha uh, himself didn't try to describe his experience of uh, so-called awakening in any real detail. He doesn't go, he, he, he says a few things, or there are a few things recorded in the Pali Canon that we t tend to assume he said, but they might have been actually written by somebody else, because the Pali Canon was uh, quite clearly changed over the years. I, I know that it's a matter of belief among some Buddhists that the Pali Canon preserves the uh, the the pristine record of exactly what the Buddha said uh, during his lifetime, but I don't believe that. Uh, some people don't even believe there was a Buddha. So you know, there's a there's a whole uh, school of thought around that. That that uh, not only doesn't it preserve what the Buddha said, but that there wasn't a Buddha. That there wasn't a guy who even said this. That it, it was all made up later. I I think that. I think those people are wrong. <laughs> I think there was a guy. But I, I do think that the words were changed over the years. But anyway, he doesn't describe his experience. Uh, pretty much no one that I know of, at least nothing that comes to mind uh, within the Buddhist tradition, tries to describe their experience. Certainly Dogen doesn't. Uh, he, he doesn't. Uh, he, he sort of uh, says a few things about... Uh, he had the feeling of dropping off body and mind uh, during a retreat that he was attending with his teacher in China, Tendo Nyojo, but about all he says about it is dropping off body and mind. Although if you read things like Genjo Koan and some of his other writings, uh, I, I think he is in a way trying to describe the experience in some of those writings, although he doesn't describe it as, I had this experience and here's what happened. He, he describes it more obliquely than that. But anyway, the tradition is that you don't talk about that. And that tradition was quite famously, at least among Zen nerds, broken by Philip Kaplow, who wrote a book called The Three Pillars of Zen. And in The Three Pillars of Zen, he interviews, I, I don't know how many, five or ten students who had these experiences in during the training that he did uh, with them, uh, which was Rinzai style Zen. But he, although I come from the Soto tradition, both the Soto and the Rinzai tradition, neither one of them uh, describes these experiences. The tradition is that we don't describe these experiences, and that exists within both Soto and Rinzai. I hope that makes I hope what I'm saying is clear. Anyway, uh, but he wrote about them. He, he, put, he put these uh, experiences in his book, not his own, that as far as I can, it's been a long time since I read the book, but other people's uh, experiences. And I read that book when I was first starting out uh, Zen, when I first started to learn about Zen. That book and the book Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind were were the two books, that and a book called Unsui. Those were the three books that uh, my first Zen teacher taught from in uh, in that Zen class that he gave at Kent State University. And I think he did that because he wanted to sort of present a fair sort of academic um, treatment of what Zen was about. And those were, he thought, the three most sort of significant books that he could teach it from. Anyhow, I read those experiences and in, in a way they kind of messed me up because I was waiting for those things to happen, the things that I read about in that book. I was, you know, kept wanting that to happen and none of that ever happened. But after the thing on the bridge happened, I remembered some of what I read in the book Three Pillars of Zen and I went, oh, I see why they described it that way. You know, it, it's it, you, it's very difficult to describe these things. So the tradition exists. I uh, and one of the things that I learned from writing about it was why the tradition exists, because I I think in writing about it I opened up uh, another 
kettle of worms or whatever. I don't know what the metaphor is. You know, I opened up this whole thing and, and a lot of people have a lot of strange ideas about my experience now. Uh, for example, I put a couple of pictures that I took that day on the bridge, the same day as I made that video, on Instagram. And a few of the comments were like, uh, this can't be the bridge, it's nothing like the way I imagined it, or I, I imagined it being one of these beautiful bridges. I guess when people heard it was a bridge in Japan, they imagined one of those beautiful sort of arched bridges that you see in old Japanese woodcuts or something, but actually it's just this kind of ugly metal bridge, as you saw in the video. Um, when I decided to write about that, I knew I was treading on... D difficult ground. I don't want to say dangerous ground. It's not really dangerous, I don't think. But difficult ground. And so before I put it out to the public, I sent what I wrote to my teacher, Nishijima Roshi. And we, we both lived in Tokyo. I guess maybe he lived outside of Tokyo anyway. We were, we were still in physical contact with each other. But he had email and so I decided I'll put it in an email and, and send it to him and show it to him so he can actually read it and instead of me just you know standing there in front of him talking about it. And he got back to me and he said he thought what I wrote was very good and that I should go ahead and make it public. Which uh, which sort of gave me the courage to, to put it out and make it public. And it was, uh, it was part of what my, the, the first version of it was part of my initial sort of foray into the internet. It, wa it wasn't really a blog in technical terms. I guess people called it a blog, but it was more of this uh, free web page thingy that I had through gol.com which was the globalonline.com, which was the internet service I had. And it didn't allow you enough space to, to keep a whole blog, you know, a whole running log, but, uh, but you could just put things up. So I would put an article up, leave it up for a week and take it down and put another one up, leave it for a week and take it down and et cetera, et cetera. So that's, uh, that's what I did with it. And I, I don't remember getting a whole lot of response uh, to that particular piece, except there, there were a few weirdos who were trying to sort of challenge me on it. I remember one guy said, uh, you know, he, I can't remember exactly, he, he quoted from some koan as if he'd made it up, you know, and he said, what say you, you know, there is uh, the, I, God, I forget it, but it was really silly. It's the, 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 these people that play Zen games on the internet. I guess it was a new thing back then, but now it's it's still going on. You can still find these kind of weirdos who play Zen games on the internet, and they're they're stupid. You know, I got a few uh, comments like that, but but not so much. It was only when I put it out as a book in in the form of a book when I put it out in hardcore Zen that I got some reactions that I thought, oh God, I've really messed things up. So uh, years later, I wrote this book called "There Is No God and He Is Always With You." And I decided to write about it again, write about the same experience again. And again, I got <laughs> weird weird uh, responses. So uh, the, the, the fact is you can't talk about these things. But it did, the, the experience sort of threw me for a loop. Uh, and one of the things I find odd about it, and if you've watched my videos, you've heard me say this before, is that I can't remember when it happened. Now you'd think something as significant in my life as an experience like that, and it was incredibly significant, uh, I, would, I would know the exact date. But not only do I not know the exact date, I can't even figure out what year it was. Because everything was sort of, you know, exploded uh, backward and forward in time from the, the incident itself. And I, it took me may, maybe years to, to recover. I don't know if recover is the right word, but to sort of uh, start being able to really um, uh, talk normal <laughs> again. I don't know. Maybe I, I was probably really strange for a few years after that happened. Uh, the only thing I know, uh, to put it and a year on it, is I know it happened before September 11th, 2001. You know, the 
big event in New York with the uh, Twin Towers getting uh, uh, the planes crashing into them. Uh, and the reason I know that is because I remember when that happened that I reflected back on this experience and saw what happened on September 11, 2001 through the sort of a lens of this experience that had happened on the bridge, which is why I said weird things about it uh, that upset people, like uh, I was one of the, uh, I was the person, I was all of the people who crashed those planes into the Twin Towers, and I was all of the people who died. Uh, I couldn't see it any other way. So it probably happened, I'm guessing, from that at the end of the 1990s, maybe the year 2000 or so, but uh, I'm not really sure. Sometimes I say 1999 because that's an easy year. <laughs> it's easier than saying the year 2000 because that's that you have to write the year 2000. Um, so uh, sometimes I say 1999. I'm just guessing, though. But that's it and you saw uh, the little in the video where I sort of tried to recreate the what it might have looked like from the outside I think that's all you can get you know if somebody had been watching me at the time and I don't think anybody was uh, they would have just seen a guy walking across a bridge and I remember kind of looking up at the sky uh, and then continuing my way across the bridge and that's all it would have looked like from the outside and I feel like that outside perspective is all you can ever get. Maybe this is why writing about it is is futile. Because even writing about it, all you ever get is the outside of the experience. You don't get anything of, of what it's actually like. But anyway, there you go. Now you've got a visual to put to it in case you ever read Hardcore Zen or sit down. Or, uh, there is no God again. You'll have a visual to put to it, and it's not that beautiful woodcut bridge. It's this ugly, industrial-looking bridge over a little kind of murky, muddy river. Uh, that's, that's what it was. Or, or I don't even know that constitutes a river. You know, it's probably a stream. Or, it, it has a name, Sengawa, and it's so it's called a river in Japan, but it's... You know, it's it's little. Anyway, there you go. So if you want to donate to me after seeing that video, you can go to the URL that you're seeing on the screen below, which is hardcorezen.info slash donate. That is hardcorezen.info slash donate. There you will find links to my PayPal and Patreon accounts. Those are my main and usually my only ways of making a living. And I appreciate your support, but you don't got to support me if you don't want to support me. We will see you next time. Have a good time all the time. Bye. Hey Sigmund, what do you think of that video? That was kind of weird and artsy and stuff. Maybe I shouldn't make videos like that anymore, huh? Well, that's your opinion, huh? All right. Well, we'll talk to you later. Bye.